2009, I was the champion. This is our team called Intercultural Education, still running. And now I'm coming uh, today on behalf of my organization. I'm the chairman. And I don't need to do operation anymore. We had a full team, so th they would do the stuff. And then we are, we are teaching, and uh, somehow, through our entrepreneurial journey, we figure out some sort of ways that is the best, in my opinion, to, to let you know. Uh, this is who I am, uh, the champion for 2009. As well, um, I get quite a lot of awards and scholarship. I, I learned the best things that I learned is in California, uh, because Stanford is a really good school, and then uh, design thinking, entrepreneurship, those kind of social innovations, I really uh, not, uh, um, learn a lot. And then I, I sit on two boards. One is about social investment. So we invest in free companies already. Uh, if, you, if your idea is valid, come to us and we have money for you. And I do also education for young people, I see as a director. As well, we, we work in an organization called Education for Good. It's um, the training school for social entrepreneurs. And then we are, we are all working there, so that's why we are here. Uh, second, Terry, introduce yourself. Maybe you can sit down first. Yeah. <laughs> because the warm up is later on, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I graduated from uh, University from PPA, uh, majored in uh, economics and finance, and then I, I graduated in HKU, getting a master of e commerce and intellectual computing. So there's no linkage between CUHK, right? <laughs> My girlfriend is graduating from Mr. <laughs> Woo! Oh, so the best university in Hong Kong, I know all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been an entrepreneur for six years. Actually, I have more than six years experience because I do my first business where I, where I was at a university too. I do all kinds of stuff. Uh, I sell t-shirts. I sell jewelry in eBay. I do websites. And then, after all, I go to work for one public business company for one year, and then I built so forth. So I quit, and then launched my first company. And then one year later, I quit, and then launched my second one. Mm -hmm. And then I work for it for five years. Right now, I'm not uh, here. Uh, right now, I'm doing something called facilitation. I facilitate circle social enterprises in Hong Kong and China. Yeah, tomorrow we are going to Inner Mongolia to coach um, a few social enterprises as well in Beijing. That, um, we are doing some real stuff about <laughs> nurturing uh, social minds for building real social enterprises. So you're in the right place. And then it's good because it's such, such a small group that we could have much more in-depth interaction, especially helping your real project. Waksam? <coughs> I'm also a CHK alumni. I, um, I gained my first year master's degree in CHK, so I'm also a social work. And I work for education for good. My main, um, main job is uh, managing a social uh, entrepreneur incubation program, so to incubate aspiring social entrepreneurs. And also, I'm also a trainer to train lean startup to design. Things are really a very good stuff to feel your idea. And I try to learn from um, um, New York. Uh, I'm in love with social enterprise, so I'm trying to gain any um, experience or um, exchange opportunity from different kinds of um, different cities. So I'm here to Lossum is one of the few uh, Hong Kong people that really learn the Lean Startup and Jaff Lean Board. Later on, you can see from New York. She's one of the experts, so um, we'll, we'll see how she can help you. Uh, startup, uh, your team need to give me a definition. And you will probably be wrong, but don't worry. You need to write, write it down. Done? Maybe start with your team. I'm always speaking to your team. You're the most experienced people here. Turning an idea from reality from zero. Uh, good design team. 
Do you have your Do you have your team definition while you already started your startup? So a startup is beginning of an idea or a project. Good. Maybe anyone study business here? You, right? Behind. You are studying information, right? Yeah. B O M. So your professor will probably don't tell you what startup is. Good, then you can try. <laughs> turn an idea to build stuff. To real stuff. Or basically, all you are saying is from zero to one. That is startup. Uh, generally, yes. Uh, but we had experts to define, particularly in details, what a, a startup is. So to introduce you a few men, um, before the definition, you need to know if you're not fail, you don't, you don't learn. So uh, all your definitions are wrong in terms of experts' uh, opinion. Because there's key terms that you didn't really say, uh, this is the answer. So from Oxford Dictionary, startup is something, uh, setting up something in motion, a new established business. So this is the English meaning for startup. That doesn't make any sense for real people, for practical values, if you know the so-called English definition. So forget about Oxford. Think about Steve Blank, uh, Stanford professor. I later on introduce him in the detail. But this is what he defines. A startup is a temporary organization used to search for a reputable and scalable business model. This is what a startup really means. When you're saying turn idea to real stuff, etc., this is those key terms. Startup is temporary. It's not lasting forever. If you're forever doing a startup, you're not successful. And the purpose of a startup is to search a scalable business model. So this phrase needs to be fast and efficient. While you already had a business model, later on we can tell you what a business model is because this is still very unclear. What do you mean by business model? And Steve Brank um, is uh, the, the big thinker in Silicon Valley. He teaches in Stanford, Berkeley, and other Ivy League schools. And he wrote something in Harvard Business School recently, two years back, I guess, why the Lean Startup changes everything. And then the White House in America bought in the idea Lean startup training is training the military service right now. And it's really crazy. What those generals need to learn about startup uh, is not about they need to build a business after their military service. They need to know the mindset of what lean startup re really means. <clears throat> Later on, we can tell you what lean startup is very different from, from startup by themselves. Uh, second person, uh, if you forget about everything, just go to their website. We, you have everything inside, more than enough for you to absorb. But uh, for this very short three hours training, we, we give you everything that we think is useful. OK. OK, uh, start, if this is start 1.0 definition, this is already too much for you to know while you have something just on paper, let's say, because um, you don't know your business at all. So. We will suggest you start up 0.1. Eric Ries is actually the Todaya, the uh, mentee of Steve Blank. Uh, using Steve Blank's model to build his own business in very successful millionaire. And he is the um, entrepreneur in residence in, in Harvard Business School. So he nurtures entrepreneurs in Harvard. And he's very, very successful to develop an idea called Lean Startup, which Steve Blank just wrote for H H HBS. <coughs> This is his definition. A startup is a human institution. Very weird definition. Designed to deliver a new product or service under condition of extreme uncertainty. While I was saying that your definition is wrong because those key terms is not there. Extreme uncertainty. You need to be aware that you don't know anything. Nothing is certain. Uh, totally blurred. Ambiguous. Confusing. Messy. This is all you would face. If you had no idea while well, you're just on paper, you probably had no feeling of what I'm talking about. But if you are talking to this design team in a studio, you probably understand these messy things, what I'm uh, <laughs> saying. 
you don't know the customer, you don't know the market, you don't know the pricing, you don't know the output, you don't know the product, you don't know whether this product is being liked by others, you don't know whether this is useful. You don't know whether this value is created for the society or not. You're questioning about yourself, your team, your organization every second. So um, this is under extreme condition. And a startup is, is basically a team. It's a human institution. Uh, one person is really, really tough to build a startup. So for those you just come along, um, you need to build your team. Uh, I was doing it myself uh, at the very beginning. And then I need to line up six people together to, to build a team. Without a team, that is really, really, really difficult. And there's no case in the world that is successful by one man to build a very successful startup. Um, a new product or surface, if you are building some old stuff, that probably your startup is, is, is building something to compete with others. While you're not better than others, that's very tough to win the competition. So uh, this is what you will face. Very, very, very messy way. And this is the startup. And this is what really looks like. You don't come as a competition. You don't come as a winner. And then you will be very, very successful. And here, I probably do it like this, 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 this come back here. Uh, and not even very successful right now. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, if you need to really learn more, uh, go to Lean, just search Lean Startup on Google. I forgot to tell you. Uh, in the past, I actually worked in Google. So uh, I had so many cases in, in technology world for their failure and success. And I worked there at that time was 2008. So it's a very, very long time ago. And some of the cases I was interacting that time become really, really, really successful. And at that time, it's not long before uh, Google was acquiring um, um, YouTube and Google Chrome and, and all the other stuff. At that time, Google Map was not very, very um, uh, use, y useful. But uh, anyway. <coughs> um, so Eric Ries, he has uh, more than like almost half a million followers. So you can see whether he, how influential this, this thinker is about and how his model is going to influence a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. Take a look at this guy. Uh, follow him on um, Twitter, LinkedIn. You'll probably learn much more than what, I'm, what we are going to say in three hours. Uh, Wikipedia said a business as providing service or goods to customer. That's it. Nothing about profitable, nothing about business model. That's why this put in Wikipedia. <laughs> Not said by whatsoever professor or experts, and you don't need to even jot notes for that. You don't. Um, who is the father of management theory? IBBA student. <laughs> you don't know. Who? who? I will give you a picture. Who? And then the MBA student said, Who's this guy? <laughs> Okay, uh, you don't need to know his name, but uh, he's Peter Drucker. He said, business, just one sentence, create and keep a customer. That's it. He wrote 65 books in his, his life, and he's coaching CEO of GE, CEO of Starbucks, CEO of almost everybody in America. He's, he's, he's so successful in a, in a way, he never run a business, but he is the guru of management theory. He invented modern management. Uh, so I encourage him to read his book. If your <laughs> professor still talk about 4P in Marketing 101, that I suggest if you really learn business, you read his book. It's better than your lecture. Please don't record that. <laughs> OK, so um, from Alex, there's another uh, scholar. Uh, 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 later on, we talk about his model. Talk about business model. While we're saying the first definition of a startup is, is to find a replicable Scalable business model. A business model is to create, deliver, and capture values. For who? For customer. And this is what a business model is different from a business. A business is running a model. So this is the model. And he built it as so famous, had nine building blocks, and all entrepreneurs were talking about this as a common law, as a common language, common knowledge. What is your business model? What is your nine building blocks? It looks like this. <clears throat> when life gives you a lemon, uh, make lemonade. Uh, we are going to talk about the lemonade business model. How, how does it look like? But a uh, lemonade quote, I really like another one. When life gives you a lemon, take them, 
free shit is cool. So, uh, your entrepreneurial journey will give you a lot of lemon. You're so sour, you're so uh, sad, but uh, take the lemon, it's free. Uh, this is the lemonade business model. First, you have your uh, customer, you sell to park visitor. You had your uh, value proposition. What are you offering? You're offering cold, tasty, natural lemonade on the go. Wow, very nice. How do you make the channel? How do you sell them? Booth to sell them or website, but that's just a silly model. And then how do you keep the relationship? You as an owner know those customer. Yeah, and then this is your revenue. As uh, lemon sales, lemonade sales and the tips. So on this right hand side, it's all about the product and the income. So this is the four, five I brought. Here, what is your key partner? The city government uh, to give you a booth to sell. What do you do as key activity? You make lemonade, you marketing, you sell. What is your key resources? Your ingredient, your recipe, the salespeople, or the booth uh, equipment? That's your key resources. This is your cost, the ingredient, the equipment, the flyer, the salary. And this nine building block is a business model. You don't even have product. How do you have a partner? I would be just very lucky to get one. How do you know what do you do while you don't even know on paper what kind of customer you're serving or what kind of product you're offering? And how do you calculate the, uh, uh, the key resources while you might be have, having nothing, just a team? And how do you keep the relationship while you're not even serving anyone yet? So this business model is good to analyze. Let's say a model of Starbucks. What, what is it offering? What is the key partner, the, the coffee farmer, etc.? What is the relationship? You have an app to, and membership to, to keep it. It's not very, very useful for a startup, but this business model is very good for an established business. To analyze the business model of Swire, let's say, they probably have 20 different models. Uh, okay, next. Uh, this is just for you to cap a reference, because later on we'll um, put this on online, then you can just download it. Uh, for you to, if you have already a model, or this is already helping you for your business class. Very, very useful than uh, traditional theory. Three questions for you to answer in the worksheet. You actually basically had a, had a worksheet, page two. Yeah. Uh, what, are you, what do you offer? Who are you offering to? And what do you deliver? Social enterprise. The challenge is whether the beneficiary group is customer or not. Let's say the, this is the team to serve an uh, ethnic minority, to train them as a tour guide. Uh, you are not serving ethnic minority. They are not your customer. They are your uh, resources. You train them to serve, let's say, overseas people who are coming to Hong Kong for a secret tour or for, for some sort of local community tour. Whether you need to understand these overseas traveler would have the need to go to this kind of local area, let's say Samshui Po or Public Estate Observation. Do they have a need? Or they just come here just for shopping? They love Chim Sa Choi and Mong Kok, etc. So you need to be very, very clear. Uh, open talk as, a, as an idea. Uh, I just make it up totally. I was thinking just to, as an example for um, students that would go for public talk for free. Let's say this kind of uh, topic. Uh, because uh, what to offer is university or high school students for online forum or social media to, to deliver to them. This is uh, the business model of what is called the open talk app, let's say. And it's not real, I just made it up yesterday night. Uh, the most inefficient way of success is to climb up the mountain as fast as possible and realize it's a wrong mountain. This is the most ineffective way of success. While you are building everything and then realize no one is buying, this is the worst things in business, a nightmare ever for a founder. And it's also said, if you're not building a solution for a particular problem, that you're pretty wrong. So I will leave the time to Terry to te talk about Lean Startup. So, uh Freddy talks about the definition of a startup, right? Uh, from Steve Bank. And uh, the definition is what? <laughs> Have you listened? <laughs> yeah.
in search for a, a repeatable and scalable business model. Oh yeah, Freddie also talks about, when we talk about business model, there is something that we don't know the answer, right? We don't know what our key activities are. Uh, we don't know our key resources. Uh, we don't know our key partners because we don't have a key partners right now, right? We are in the style at, at stage. And then we don't have customer relationship because we don't have a customer right now, okay? So that's the problem. You don't know what product to, to, to offer. The challenges of using business model for style is that there are many hy unclear hypotheses. So you assume that your customers have, have that kind of problems, and then you assume that your solution can solve that problem, and that's the biggest challenge. You know, just like the quote, you climb a raw mountain, you build everything, you're, you're excellent, you're an excellent climber, but you climb a raw mountain, okay? And then the second one, you don't know who your customers are. And then you don't know if your customers will buy them. So that's the product market fit, okay? So we introduce this another tool for you, so-called Lean Canvas, okay? So Lean Canvas was making it as actionable as possible while staying entrepreneur-focused. So this guy, Ash Marua, uh, he invented this. Actually, he modified the business model canvas into a lean canvas that is suitable for start. Okay? So you can go to this website and then find many information about the lean canvas. So here is the lean canvas, okay? Nine grids, same as business model canvas. At, the, at your right hand side, there are some so called market fits. We have the customer segments, we have the unfair advantage channels, revenue streams and unique, uh, unique value proposition in the middle. Okay, and at your le left hand side, there's a so-called so product fit. Okay, so we have problems, top three problems. We have solution, we have key metrics, and then cost structure. Okay, so I will talk about it one by one. So what's the, what's the sequence? There's a suggested sequence for doing this filling these grids. The first one would be your problems and customers. Because if you don't have any customers, you don't have a reason to build a startup. Okay? If you don't have, a, and you, if you don't have any problems, you don't need to build a startup. Okay? So that's the first grid. And then we will put unit value position at the second, but usually I would do a solution first. Okay? How can you solve that problem? Okay, and then you, and then I will do the unit value proposition, and then we will, I will do the channels, the revenue, calls, key metrics, and then the last one will be unfair advantage. So the difference between this is small canvas and in canvas, you can see this one, this one, this one, and this one. We change this all that key. Activities, key partners, key resources, and then customer relationship to problems, solution, key metrics, and fair advantage. Why? Because as a startup, you are in search for a repeatable and scalable business model, right? And in order to be repeatable and scalable, you got to have a very concrete problem, solution, customer, match. You need to know who your customers are, you need to know their problems, and you, and you need to know that you can solve them. So this is so-called you deliver value to customers because you can solve their problems. Okay? So most of fail from a lack of paying customers. Yeah, that's the case. It is common sense, right? For a business to survive, it's easy. If you have paying customers, you survive. You can earn money. So your initial goal is to improve lightly successfully 
of your venture and reduce the risk of failure. You know, uh, Freddie has sh shown you the graph of a success, okay? It's a very maxi process, and then you go there, right? Our job using Lean Stop is to reduce the uncertainty in a systematic way, in a scientific way, okay? So enable yourself to actually make the jump into a full-time ensure <laughs> Okay, so here's the case. If you're doing a stop, you'll probably like the number one. It's a very messy process. You don't know where you go. You have so many ideas. I want to do that all. I want to try that. Oh, this one is possible. This one is also possible. So you will try A, B, C, D, and then figure out what is, what is good, what is not good, right? But if you use Lean Stop, it is also messy. <laughs> okay, it is also messy. But at the same time, there's a frame that you know you're going to the right direction. Okay, it's also messy for the process, but you know the direction. Okay, so open talk. Uh, so my idea, uh, so we will continue the idea for early stage development if there is any um, particular goal for the, but before the talk uh, I, uh, example, this is the redefined question before anything. Do you have a problem worth solving? This is also on your worksheet. I want you to write it down. Uh, particular, I just picked up um, the design studio case for the worth solving problem. They wrote a uh, food waste. Definitely worth solving. Hong Kong has terrible food waste. But that's not your business model. That's your social mission. Your business is to use the food waste to make something meaningful and nice and beautiful for some company to give as a souvenir. So the problem that you are worth solving for the customer is they are lacking of meaningful gift to give to their client or their need. That's it. Is this problem really worth for the customer to buy your product? Or they don't care? Or they have very little budget? Then you know your market is it big or is it small, is it difficult or is it easy? But that's the problem we're talking for. For social enterprise, you at least have two problems that you need to think whether it's worth talking for. The social problem, customer problem. Uh, most of the case, the social enterprise students would think 200% on just social problem. I want to tackle poverty. I want to help the old people. I want to help the old and poor people. And I want to this, this, change the world. But never really think of what a business really need for your customer's problem. If you build the best product and really nice and beautiful and sell zero for that, that is you are climbing the wrong mountain. And okay. next, the open top next. For the, this world problem solving for is whether this young student miss out great learning opportunity is the problem that I think this is worth solving for. But is it a social enterprise? I don't think it's actually very social. Is basically an educational app. Yeah, next. For example, this is in CHK. Two Nobel laureates came in. I don't know whether you received the news or not. It's free. And it's so inspiring. And you missed it out. I was thinking this is such a mess, it's such a waste. But that's one hour free talk in nice video capture. If you really want it, go to chk.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Terry. So, when you say about uh, your business, what will you fear about? You fear about the market problem potential? You fear about the competition situation barrier? You fear about your idea service execution? Are they all important? Will you fear about it? Will you fear about it? Yeah. But what's the most important thing? Is it <laughs> left upper corner? Just one thing. People want it. Just one thing, yeah. So, four extremely important words if you forget everything today. You have to remember these four words. Make something people want, <laughs> okay? I always describe uh, someone's uh, word that people don't want as artistic, okay? It's good, yeah, it's good, it's beautiful. 
really beautiful, but I don't want it. Okay? So business is not the case. So right now, we are talking about customer development. Uh, it's developed by Steve Blank, so the mentor of uh, Eric Ries. And in customer development, there, there are so many blocks I won't talk about in details, but for customer discovery, you, you, you will find that there are some small circles over there. There are problem solution fit. You have to propose MVP, and then so-called for propose funnel, and then to the customer validation, you, you get to find the product market fit, and then your business model. If you can't find it, we have a term, pivot. Actually, it's a change. Yeah, it's a bad change. You need to go back to the process all over again, okay? So, right now, problem, customer sets, okay? Problems and customer segment, you will need to need three top problem customer segments are facing. And then most problems have solutions already, list their current solution. That means the first thing you need to ask is about problems and customers. So why do we need to talk, uh, list out three, not four, five, six, seven, or one, two? No reason. Three is a magic number in business. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Because one, two, three is easy to remember. That's the reason. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's the case. And then you need to list out your existing alternatives. They may not solve all three problems. Maybe they can only solve the first one, the second one, but they cannot solve the third one. Okay, but you need to list it out because you need to know the market condition. So if you're talking about customers, oh, there it is this. Most common mistakes that everyone would go for it, okay? If you are targeting all people, even Google can achieve that. Good luck with your ideas. Okay, and talk about competition. If you think of soda herbal drink has no comp competitors, you're actually competing with all kinds of soda and herbal drinks. So you need to be focused. Okay, there are three words in, uh, in startups, only three words. Focus, focus, and focus. Nothing else, okay? Remember it three times, okay? Three is magic number, <laughs> okay? Focus, focus, and focus, okay? So open heart again. <laughs> there are a question next on the worksheet. Who are your target customers? I want you to list three features from your target customer. Who are these people? What are you selling to? Who are they?
C, 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 A. Good. Good. Next step. They're all wrong. <laughs> okay. So the first step is to get out of the building and talk to your potential customers. Because you don't know whether you think their problem is, it's really a problem. So maybe I ask you, do you have a problem? Have you attended the, the Mohammed Yunus talk? Do you know this kind of thing? <laughs> hey, hey, do you know? Do no. you know that talk? No. No, you, you're a CUHK student. You yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's the case, you know. Uh, we try to validate the problems first because we assume they have these blah, blah, blah problems. But we don't know where it, they, they, they really have these kind of problems. Okay, so we need to talk, about, talk to them. Okay. So you learn more in a day talking to customers than a week of brainstorming, a month of watching comparators, or a year of market research. Okay. So in case that you are in a brainstorming stage, you know what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So many of you are in the brainstorming stage. So go out and talk to your customers. So perhaps the most common advice for button entrepreneurs is get out of the building. Okay, get out of the building. Don't sit here. There's no fast inside a building. Get out of the building. Yeah. So your objective is to define an early adopter, not mainstream customers. I talk about focus, focus, and focus. So you need to be focused on your target customers. You can't say your target customer is the general public. You can't say it because even Google can't do it. Okay? So you need to be focused. You need to find out who is your uh, early adopter. So, yeah? Yeah, good question. Freddie will answer it in the later sessions. <laughs> good question. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. So, and then we talk about the solution. Once you find out who uh, your early adopters are, uh, the problems, you can now decide the solution. Okay? So, well, can't do it, wait, oh, gosh. So, two solutions to our student problems. Process of learning, validated learning starts for, with hypothesis and confirm your assumptions with evidence. What does that mean? Okay, so you, you got to know whether your solution can f really solve that three problems. That's the meaning. So, this is the assumption, right? You brainstorm a solution. Okay, I, I want to deliver, for example, uh, for the open top, let's say, I, I would like to deliver an app, okay? So then you assume that your app can solve that free problems, right? I don't know, I have no money, I don't, I don't know the talk, I want to get inspired, yeah. That's the case, okay? So for open talk. Uh, this is the problem. They assume that people want to be inspired, the information overload, and they have no money. The solution B is whether I would love to collect all these great famous speakers in town and only update weekly for all these great talks and offer only for free for these talks. Then it's like, okay, problem, solution B. But this is all my assumption for people who want to be inspired.
highlight of what he's talking about or one quote or one article for 400 words. Why I need to use 60 minutes to sit there? Yes, so this is only I assume. And when you assume the problem, you think it's true. <laughs> you think that is the problem. And you can figure out a solution based on your assumption, but maybe your assumption is totally wrong. That's why we need to validate the learning with evidence. For example, I interviewed a hundred of all these IB students, students, global business students, IBGM students, etc. All these bright and top students want to be inspired, and they say they don't have time for that. Do we have a better solution? And then I may need to change my app to be only top highlight, two minutes wisdom. That would, be, that would sound better. I don't know. I need to talk to them. Yeah. Okay. So, look why. So we talk about the concept of MVP. It is a very important concept in Lean Start. So called minimum viable product. That two words are very important. Minimum and viable. Okay. So minimum viable product is to tax your solution and problem face. So the two keywords, minimum, so you build it with minimum features at a very low cost, okay? But you can deliver value. You can solve the customer's free problems, okay? So that's the meaning of viable. You can solve that problem. That's viable, minimum, minimum features. If it is not related to the problems, you eliminate it, okay? So many entrepreneurs would, would like to build, for example, an app, very fancy, I, de I design it, do all kinds of stuff, I talk about user experience, okay, oh, Google, wow, how, how can we do that? Oh, well, the design and the logo, you know, and I have to design all this stuff right, right now, but for MVP, it's not the case. Because if, it is, if the design is nothing to do with the problems, we eliminate, okay? So MVP for open top, what would we do, what would we do about it? Just a Facebook page? Yeah. It's easy, right? We don't need an app, actually. <laughs> we don't need to spend thousands of money to, to develop an app, spend three months, okay, design all the stuff, design interface. We don't need We just need to launch a Facebook page, collect all the information, notify them, that's it. We can test it. Okay. So. So while we have the product, let's say the problem solution fit is to build a product, what we call the MVP. And then when you have a product, we need another set of fits called product market fit. If this is the product, let's say a Facebook page for open top, great speakers for free events, information. Whether the market actually like it, whether they will engage it, and what is their background? What is the solution? What, uh, what do they say? What do they need for later on? And then you can use this MVP to collect all the data. And then, uh, if we really try, you, I would expect actually those people who are really eager to learn are not the brightest and the smartest and the high school people from global business. They're probably from IB, from high school. They would love to come to the university to listen to great speaker because this is not in their common life. They would love to take a picture and change their profile picture and say I'm in CUHK and I listen to Nobel laureate. Yes, I, I just expect, I don't know. <laughs> so this is proper market fit. And then I will see this market is not fitting the problem. Either I change the product or I change the target market. And you can think whether you have the product and then we can talk about the product market. Loxum well, is an expert. I want YouTube. You can say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a thing for, before YouTube is now um, open for people to uh. upload, their video, upload their video on that. Do you know what is its original idea? Anyone who has an idea about YouTube? What Obviously. they want to build original. They want to build. Um, a platform for people who want dating. <laughs> you can search, search online for the case for you. It's very funny. It's totally different for what you are saying now. But originally, they want to match people 
on a web page. <laughs> and the design is simple, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, if, you're, if you are not embarrassed by the first version of your product you are launched today, who said it? Rick Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn. Okay? So even for startups, even for established business while they are trying to have their new product, they would do a trial. This is just how their logo changes, it doesn't matter. Uh, they try to launch Frappuccino in uh, 2006. Yes. Uh, Frappuccino was invented in Korea uh, because it's hot and then people want some cool things to drink and it's funny and it's nice. And the whole world of other Starbucks uh, uh, region didn't really want what, what Frappuccino, what is that? Why, why in a coffee shop you need to drink some cold stuff with ice and with fruity taste? This is totally not Starbucks feeling. But then they realized uh, after a small launch and then a small tryout in different region, different city, a limited edition, limited time zone, limited things, and then they become a plus. It's like, oh, it's, it's all selling. It's one of the most profitable products in summer. And people were crazy for Frappuccino. So um, you can you can do a lot of try and error, a lot of try out. And Starbucks also tried another thing, which is selling the bottled coffee in supermarket. This is another story. This is all written on his book, Pull Into Your Heart, by the CEO of Starbucks. You can read his case, it's very inspiring, it's motivated. A lot of failure as well. A lot of trial and error. If you're not failing, you're not learning. So capture all this validated learning and improve your stuff. Okay, looks fine. Okay, the only way to win is to learn faster than anyone else. Okay, you encounter many failures. Okay, I cannot guarantee your MVP will be a successful. I cannot guarantee your product was successful. I cannot guarantee you you can find a problem. Okay, but the beautiful thing is you can learn. It. Okay, you learn about your customer when you talk about it. Okay, so now we go to the unit value proposition. Unit value proposition is from customer's perspective, okay? Not from your perspective, okay? You, you need to stand at the same position of customers, okay? And build this thing, okay? A bundle of benefits summarizes why customers turn to your company. Actually, we talk about value. So how can you solve that problems? And that's the value, right? That's the benefits. So. McDonald's. <laughs> There's a case when we talk about unique value proposition uh, before the slides. Uh, I had uh, one experience in London. They had a social enterprise called Secret Tour. It's basically bringing you around unseen places of London with the history, with those things were not in Wiki, uh, Wikipedia or on uh, Lonely Planet. And then uh, the tour was excellent. The explanation was really nice. And those tour guides are actually homeless people trained by an NGO and it's a very well run social enterprise in London. But from customers' perspective, it's not because you're, you're run by homeless people that you can, that I buy your own product. It's because you bring me to somewhere in London that no traveler would go and know the story. So where it needs a well mixed it's even better. But if it's run by any professional people, tour guide, that's still very nice. So from customer perspective, what is the benefit that people need to buy your product? Social enterprise always think people buy for their social mission. Partly right, partly wrong. People buy your quality of product that solve their problem. So I have a few coach, coaching teams, social enterprise. They have very good social mission. But they need to focus on what the customer think of them instead of what they are proposing to the society. Sometimes you don't need to tell others you are social enterprise. Well, you can solve a customer product problem, you are a good enterprise. So, uh, about value proposition, wild well, guess, what is McDonald's unique value proposition? From the customer perspective, what is the benefit? Have you entered the Yes. What are you buying? Fast. Convenient. Come on. You have to be cheap. This is exactly yeah. what yeah. McDonald's is so good to propose. We are cheap and fast and convenient food. Come for us and you'll, you'll be fat. <laughs> <laughs> like Freddy. <laughs> for healthy, 
it's not in their opposition. They try to put veggie, uh, uh, veggie burger. Such a failure. No one is going to McDonald's to buy veggie stuff. No one is going to buy salad. In London, it's okay. In Hong Kong, no. Uh, okay, next. Uber, what is their unique value proposition? What are you buying for? Anyone try Uber? What are you buying for? Before uh, David got the uh, 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 graduate, so he already got the offer full time as an analyst for Goldman Sachs. High salary, stable job. So he goes to the interview, uh, get the offer, sign the name, 
The next day he quit. <laughs> Just to prove that he would have a great job, but he chose to be an entrepreneur. And before he actually graduated from University of Chicago, he quit. He didn't need a, a, a certificate to prove that he could be a good entrepreneur. And he, he went to the Y Combinator, uh, build something people want. It's called the, the Harvard for Entrepreneurs. Uh, and he, he is one of the few team that are Chinese background. He already got five million US dollar investment for their startup. But their startup, called, um, uh, strikingly, is, is like this right now. Uh, very nice, very beautiful. Just you screw down, and it's very easy for any dummy used around five minutes can build a website, and it's for free. And if you need to change the domain name, not ending with strikingly, you need to pay. For any professional website, that you need your own domain name, so you pay for them. And that is very, very convenient. And they actually offer for all uh, Hong Kong set to use it for free, uh, as, because uh, Da Feng is a CHK graduate. And their story is, while they were undergrad, they are in student club. They want to have a Kickstarter for a student project. So they offer a website, very nicely built in Chicago, for all the American student society to fundraise there, whether it is about demonstration, about environmental project, and anything. Put your project online and then get donation. No student club are actively using that. But after talking to a hundred of these customers, why are you using this, uh, our platform, why are you not using, they realize one problem. These students had very low budget to build a beautiful website for their project. So they realize this is the customer pain, huge pain. And most of the students, especially who study BBA, had no IT background <laughs> and no idea how to build a nice website. So they figured out whether they could be the agency for all these young people who had low budget and very few information just to promote. So they built strikingly. And um, Forbes magazine interviewed them for their successful case. They, they tell everything in the story about um, they had only two weeks budget. Everyone is eating ramen for two weeks. And five, six people in one uh, dormitory to build their first website totally fail. Everybody went back to school after the summer, and everybody went to uh, get a job. But then they would keep thinking, we figure out very clear customer pain, and we know that this would go big. So he would keep building it, and then strikingly become one of the very, very successful uh, agency for building websites. <clears throat> Pivot is what I'm trying to say. Customer uh, validation, as well as unique value proposition. The unique value proposition for Strikingly is very clear, easy, beautiful, cheap website building. Uh, this is on the video. Well, I'll talk about Lean Startup. It's about validated learning, about scientific experiment, and about the product release, which is the next. Build, measure, and learn. It's about, while you are not sure about your customer, you go out of the building, you ask them, while you're building an MVP, you measure whether what is the feedback of the customer. In the open talk example, the Facebook page, getting all the comments is the customer measurement. And what is the learning out of that? And then rebuild, remeasure, relearn. This is the loop. And then it's keep evolving and evolving. Even Facebook is keep evolving every day. Uh, they would launch the dislike button very soon. But it's not called dislike. It's called empathy, empathy button. Somehow your friend had someone passed away, you won't kick like. But then you will feel, I want them to know, and I don't know what to comment on. Only our rest in peace or something, but you click the empathy button, feel, okay, I feel empathy for you. This is what um, Mark was thinking. And this is, must be useful. And then this is also customer pain. But somehow, um, yeah, so empathy button. This is how they're measuring and learning every day. Uh, next. <clears throat> Pivot, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> Explain to me who are your customers and what kind of value that you're bringing them. I mean, your worksheet, you already write down quite a lot, but uh, your unique value proposition and then your early adopter, et cetera. So let's go straight <clears throat> to uh, the tool, empathy map. 
next. Very simple. That's always in uh, every human individual had a, a gain point, had a pain point, and had a task to do. For example, uh, what an example. Coca-Cola as a drink is giving a gain point or is solving a pain point. Gain, pain. Gain point is you get it and then you feel very happy. Pain point is a painkiller. When you had headache, you take a Panadol. Both. So Coca-Cola is also solving a, a pain point. What kind of pain? You are feeling dry and you should drink Coca-Cola. <laughs> and also you can take a look at their advertisement. What they, are they advocating? Joy, happiness. Is it gain or pain? Gain. When you feel it's a normal day of life, drink Coca-Cola. That's why they make so much, such, so much money. Or you have no idea what to drink, drink Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah, and um, <clears throat> pain point is to solve a particular question, a problem that they're facing. Uh, for example, uh, you want to learn uh, mathematics or a um, particular thing, that, and you don't want to pay. This is the pain point. Khan Academy came in as, as free education online. This is solving the pain. Or it could also be the gain, because you have some time, you want to learn something useful. Could be. But pain point, gain point is easy to understand. What is task really means? Actually, anyone who does a, an action is in order to do something. If you're offering, let's say, a uh, children-parent relationship push thing uh, workshop, they're supposed to have a task. It's, let's say in the weekend, you have a holiday, you have a kid, and you have nothing to do and you don't know what to offer, which is meaningful, healthy, and could improve our relationship. Your competitor could be picnic, could be uh, ocean park. Where the ocean park is expensive and is the whole day time consuming, what is the task that they really want? Maybe just kill an afternoon, because in evening you need to bring the kid to the grandparent. Something like that. You think of a task, what, what are they going to do with your product? So that is very, very clear. For the souvenir, this is definitely they need to have a task. And then every time focus on those big NGO who had five year anniversary, 55 year anniversary, they definitely will have a lot of celebration. And to tell you the tip, Tonghua Group of Hospitals, 145 years this year. Go to Tonghua Group of Hospitals. <clears throat> and, and next one is, uh, this is what I want you to fill in now. What do you think your customer need to do for your product? It's in your worksheet, I guess. And then uh, what, do, what would they want to gain? And what is their pain that they need to ease? If it's not in your worksheet, you write down this question and then uh, drop it down. Go on. Uh, Biggest risk in building a business. You think there is a problem. You think the customer segment care about this problem. You think the current solution are not good enough. You think the, your solution is the best <laughs> and most suitable. And you think the customer segment think your, your solution is 10 times better than the others. This is the riskiest assumption in general. And I think most of the startup did not really pass the first risk. <laughs> Empathy map uh, had another thing called the value map. Same thing. Uh, basically, it's fitting in the empathy map. What are you offering as a game creator? What are you relieving as the pain reliever? And what are these surface and product you're offering to fit in the task? And then this is the fitting map. You don't, you don't need it because basically what is the gain you're providing to the game? What is the pain you're solving the pain? And what is the surface to help the task, basically? Uh, this is the question. If you are going to ask, would you use this product to do what, what, what? How much would you pay for it? If you go and ask, <laughs> I'm very sorry, but this is bullshit. <laughs> This is definitely not the question to ask. It's totally wrong. No one would give you very honest feedback if you're their friend. If, you're, if you ask your classmate, probably they would not say anything rude to you. Uh, but 
this is the advice. Do not talk about your idea. Ask how they solve the problem currently. Do not ask about the future, what they would do and think and envision the future, but ask how would they uh, solve the current problem or what are, what are the past experience that feel even more painful to try other experience. Then you know their preference and values. These are the practical questions that you don't ask with the word would. If, if we build a product that solves whatsoever problem, would you use it? Would you pay for it? Would you like existing solution to be better if? What, what, what? This is envisioning the future. Henry Ford say a very, very clear example in the past about if I ask people what they want, they would have set a faster horse before the car was invented. If you think it's too long ago, 19th century stuff, Steve Jobs said a similar thing. It's really hard to design a product by focus groups. A lot of time people don't know what they want until you show them. So don't ask about the future. But they already understand their pain point and their current problem and the challenges and the bad past experience. Then you figure out and listen. So these are the questions that you should ask. You can take a picture. And or, uh, this PowerPoint will be on CHK website. What is the hardest part about existing contact problem? What is the last time this happened? For example, the children relationship. What was the hard thing to, to raise a kid for weekend? Yeah, they're running around. They're the too energetic, I need to catch them and I'm tired. I want a facilitator to help. Something like this. Why was that so hard? So I'm tired. After five days of work, I still need to take care of my kid. That is a headache. That's a nightmare. What, if anything, have you have done to solve the, that problem in the past? And what don't you love about the solution that you have tried? Then you listen. Most useful interview is when, when you were asked to record, so we can keep listening the inner words and the hidden meaning. So um, go to customerdevelopmentlabs.com. There's so many sets of questions that will inspire you. Very, very practical. But how do you get the first 30 customers? This is not the question that we're here to tell you the answer. You need assumptions. You need hypothesis. You need experiment. We don't know each case. And we don't know also how you are going to validate your learning. If you set wrong assumption, if you do wrong experiment, if you climb up the mountain and realize it's wrong, that is a set starting. But then if you learn a lot, that would be a good start. So we don't know. But there's another website to help called focus.customerlabs.com. Also helps you a lot whether you are in the right track to ask your customers pain and whether you're building the painkiller. Um, next. <clears throat> the most important thing about social mission now, the whole three hours that we are talking about is how to build a startup, what is a startup, the tool for startup, for lean canvas, for experiment board, for customer interview, go off the building and the video. We never talk about social mission. I coach social enterprise team, we, and we met a lot, uh, we realized you are going to help people with a good heart, and then you become those people who need help. <laughs> your business model fail, you are lacking of money, and you are running out of capital, and you are, your social business is going to die. The, I was in Harvard uh, one time, and the professor was saying, there is no social entrepreneurship. There are only entrepreneurs who had a social mind. So they're running successful business, and the business is helping the society. We are sometimes in very wrong focus on it must be social in starting. Yeah, this would be good to start a business with a social mind. But a business, it would be successful only by what Peter Drucker said. What is the most important thing? Yeah, that's what Paul said. <laughs> Same. Because you need to create a customer. This is what builds, people, builds something people want. If you have a great social mission as a failing business, the social enterprise is going to fail. If you have a good business with our social mind, you are an SME owner, that is fine. You don't need to be helped. It's good to turn a business to, have a, to, to equip with a social mission in between. Like how you build a great product 
while helping others, or how you serve the underprivileged group with a profitable business idea. For example, you, you make something affordable, affordable housing, affordable bike, affordable test, textbook. These are you are going to help the underprivileged group as they are the service uh, beneficiaries. Uh, if you can't really fix the both, social mission and the business practicality, I would first let you focus on the business side first. If you can run a business successfully, then it's, it's just a normal business, you are an entrepreneur. Then one day you can turn the business to be very social. But if you really need to have both, and I think uh, social enterprise is one of the ways to solve a social problem, one of the ways. There could be NGO, it could be charity, it could be uh, government to help solving the social problem as well. Some people are obsessed with social enterprise, that they think this is the only way, this is redefining capitalism. Yeah, that's called socialism. <laughs> uh, this is only one of the ways. So if this ways is not going to solve the problem and earning money at the same time, I would suggest either focus on being an NGO, get some funding, don't make a business to have the social problem, or just make some money and donate. That is also fine. There's no, there's no problem to be rich and helping others. Yeah, so if you are really focusing on the social problem and you had to solve it, and social enterprise is not the way, then it's fine. I was in Oxford one time, and then there's a big discussion about social enterprise is going to kill all the charity, <laughs> and then uh, uh, one one gentleman raised up their hand and said, "Excuse me, we are in Oxford. This is 800 years old charity, and no one is going to kill it, and it's older than any government, any charity, and any businesses." And when you are saying social enterprise is going to replace charity, it's definitely wrong. When a charity is offering quality solution to a particular problem, for example, extremely high quality education, this is not going to be replaced easily. Even Cambridge, while trying to chase for 600 years, cannot overcome Oxford. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is what Deng Xiaoping is trying to say. It doesn't matter whether it's a black cat or a white cat, it's a good cat when it catch a mouse. So if you want to solve problem, millions of ways to solve problem. If you want to earn money, also millions of ways. If you want to have to combine the both and not resting while you're not combining two, two I would suggest you either become a very successful businessman or become a very successful social solution maker uh, and then figure out whether social entrepreneurship could be your way out. Yeah. While you are starting, for example, this group, more business, behind group, more social, it's fine. There's no one would tell you you are on the wrong track. Only the customer will tell you that I want your product or not, I pay or not. And social problem is always very difficult to solve. And so far, no one particular social enterprise it could solve from root cause uh, one particular social problem, where it be poverty or environmental issue or uh, aging, etc. So just be realistic. No one here is changing the world for a large scale so far. So if you're taking part in a competition and you are starting up your business, just focus on what you could in your circle of influence. And don't think too much and don't think you are the savior and just be very, very practical. Use the model, use the canvas to build your small business. Grow it, help the customer. Build values, let them pay you, be rich, grow your business, think social. That's his end. Thank you very much.